Right, in this unit, we turn to behaviorism. Uh, like pragmatism, behaviorism is, historically speaking, a relative newcomer on the intellectual scene. It's uh, primarily a phenomenon of the 20th century, although we can see the roots being laid in the late 19th century. Uh, like pragmatism and also like realism, I think it's fair to say that behaviorism is broadly naturalistic. Uh, like the realists and the pragmatists, uh, they contrast themselves to the idealists who typically are more otherworldly and uh, much more religion-friendly in their uh, approaches to philosophy. Behaviorism is uh, rigorously naturalistic in its approach, uh, but more importantly and more distinctively to behaviorism as approach is a, a fairly ruthlessly reductionistic account of human nature. And while with the realists and the pragmatists, the behaviorists are strong advocates of scientific method, uh, uh, behaviorism outstrips both of those in the kind of the ruthless and rather reductionistic way in which uh, it applies scientific method to the understanding of the, the human being. Uh, the behaviors will argue uh, as the 20th century approaches that it is time for uh, psychology to take its place among the world's sciences. Uh, uh, like many other sciences prior to uh, psychology, uh, uh, they had cut the apron sings, strings, rather, so to speak, from the mother discipline of philosophy over the course of the centuries as the modern world progressed. And by the time we get to the uh, beginning of the 20th century, there's a critical mass of thinkers who argue that it's time for psychology to distinguish itself from philosophy and to establish itself as a science, as a distinctive science with its own subject matter and with its own methodology for, for studying this. Now, the uh, psychologists or the early psychologists who are making the case for psychology as a distinct uh, uh, science, the behaviorists uh, among them, will argue that there's a natural progression that has uh, come about in the modern world uh, as uh, philosophy separated itself from theology in the early modern world, and then progressively over the course of the centuries, uh, the sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, and so forth, establish themselves as independent uh, subject matters. So if we do a quick historical tour, we uh, can, for example, go back to the 1600s. And it's in the 1600s uh, that we find physics uh, establishes itself significantly uh, as an independent branch of study, independent subject matter from philosophy, from theology, and a distinctive methodology for studying the, uh, the subject matter of, of physics. Now, this is a hard-fought battle uh, through the latter part of the 1500s and on into the early part of the 15, uh, 1600s, rather. We saw in the case of uh, Giordano Bruno uh, and then Galileo being silenced in the early part of the 1600s. But nonetheless, uh, scientists like Galileo and others of the time did do the foundational work to establish physics as, as a discipline, even if in Galileo's case he was silenced, Bruno was, uh, was uh, uh, burned at the stake and others were, uh, were threatened and intimidated in various ways. Nonetheless, by the time we get to the 1640s and the 1650s, physics is established. And then in the latter part of the 1600s, in the generation of Isaac Newton, physics matures and uh, a significant theoretical framework is developed that then establishes uh, physics for the next couple of centuries. In the 1700s, it is the turn of chemistry. And uh, obviously there had been pre-scientific work or proto-scientific work done in the 1500s, 1600s, and so forth. But it's by the time we get to the 1700s that chemistry matures, uh, can establish itself as an independent science. And one uh, landmark indication of this is toward the end of the 1700s, again, we have the first elaboration and articulation of the periodic table by, uh, I believe, Lavoisier. In the 1800s, it is then the turn of another science, biology. And again, we can see there's lots of proto-biological work being done in the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s, and so forth. But again, it's not until we get to the middle part of the 1800s that a mature theoretical framework uh, that accounts for or, or, or uh, is in a position to account for all of the major phenomenon emerges. And that is, uh, of course, uh, the Darwin evolutionary theory, or we should probably say the Darwin and Wallace evolutionary theory. Um, 
many thinkers, of course, have been developing the taxonomical schemes uh, that biologists use, working out all of the kingdoms, genuses, and species, and so on, 1700s and 1800s. But Darwin puts it all together. And then uh, in the next generation, Mendel, uh, unknown to Darwin, works out the basics of genetics. And then, so by the end of the 1800s, if you put evolution and genetics together, you've got the modern synthesis that biology then uh, 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 operates within.